Good morning and welcome. Welcome to the Kettering Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm delighted that you are with us, those of you who are seated here and those who might be watching online. And I'm especially delighted to see and hear you, friends. From Washington Adventist University this morning, we have Pro Musica, a choral group, and the New England Youth Ensemble, and we will hear them soon. And we're delighted that they are here with us. This morning, I want to share with you a scripture passage found in John. John chapter 13. Jesus had just washed their feet. John chapter 13, verses 12 and forward. When he had washed, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. This morning, here at the Kettering Seventh-day Adventist Church, we will be participating in our quarterly communion service. And this morning, we're going to start our service with the foot washing. This is the ordinance of humility. And as I just shared with you, Christ did this, asking us to do the same. Our master served his people. And we as a church family have that opportunity this morning. We practice the open communion, and this is part of that. If you're with a child or if you have a visitor, do not feel obligated to do the ordinance of humility, which is the foot washing, but all are invited and all are welcome to. At this time, we invite those who would like to participate in this to walk across the way to the fellowship hall where everything is set up for our foot washing. If you are visiting and you don't want to go, please remain here. There will be lovely music you will be able to enjoy. And if you'd like to go and you don't have anyone to wash your feet, please flag down one of us pastors. We'd be happy to participate with you. At this time, the ordinance of humility across the hall in the fellowship hall.
Hello and welcome to worship at the Kettering Adventist Church. We are glad to have you here with us this Sabbath. This is your K-Life update. This Sabbath, following our worship services, is our monthly fellowship meal. Come and enjoy this time together as we spend time as a community of faith, building those relationships and enjoying good food. At five o'clock, Washington Adventist University will be hosting a concert in the sanctuary of the Kettering Adventist Church. This concert will actually involve two different music groups. One of them is the New England Youth Ensemble. The other one is a group made up of Washington Adventist University students called Pro Musica. Anyone is welcome to come out to this event, this concert, so please feel free to come out at five o'clock to enjoy what Washington Adventist University has to present. October 13 is what we here at the Kettering Church are taking as a day of fasting and prayer. The reason that we're calling our church to this is because on October 14, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists are making some big and important decisions that affect our world church and how we function as a church in the body of Christ. We're not having an official gathering, we're not pulling people together, so this is just between you and God, maybe your family or close friends. We want to pray that whatever happens on that day, whatever decisions are made on the 14th, that God's purpose would prevail, his kingdom would grow, and Christ would be glorified. So we invite you, if you would like to participate, to join us on October 13 for a day of fasting and prayer. On Sabbath, September 20, Spring Valley Academy is hosting here at our church their annual convocation. This is a special convocation for them celebrating 50 years of ministry to our kids. Our speaker will be Principal Darren Wilkins, and we will have all of our services at the same normal time. So 10 o'clock for first serve, 11 o'clock for Sabbath school, and then 12 o'clock for our two serve time. So join us on September 20 for Spring Valley Academy's Convocation. And on October 27, we have our No Fright Night. This year's theme, are you ready for it? Our mateys, it's pirate theme treasure hunt. That's what we're gonna be focusing on for the theme. We're gonna have all sorts of games. If you've been here before for No Fright Night, it's gonna be a blast for the kids, but we also need a lot of volunteers to help it be a blast for the kids. So if you're interested in volunteering and helping out, please, you can go onto the Kettering website and sign up. You can sign up at the info desk. So we hope you come out six to 10, October 27, to volunteer or to enjoy the festivities. My name is Patty McCoy, and this has been your K-Life Update. Good morning. It is time for Kids Life, so all of those uh, kids who would like to come up for that uh, can come up now and collect the offering on your way down as well. Uh, also a slight correction, uh, most of us probably could catch that, but uh, our Spring Valley Convocation is actually October 20, not September 20, which was a while back, so uh, yeah, that is a correction. <laughs> Good morning to all of you. Who of you can tell me what your favorite plant is, or one of your favorite plants? Yeah. My favorite plants are 
Sunflower, please. Sunflowers. I love sunflowers. My wife, her favorite flowers are sunflowers. Anybody else? Oh, yeah? Tulips. Ooh, tulips. I love tulips, too, especially in the spring. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about plants today, specifically something called grafting. Who knows what grafting is? Does anyone know what grafting is? I didn't think so. Okay, so grafting is a way to help plants grow. A lot of you probably know that most plants grow from seeds. So you put little seeds in the ground and then plants come up. Well, what grafting is, is just another way to get plants to grow, um, but it's done with plants that have already come up from seed. And so what you do with grafting is, you take one piece of a plant like this, and then you take another piece of a different plant, um, not always a different plant, but it can be a different plant, and you cut into uh, the plant and you take away the bark, you take away the outer covering of that plant, and you get into something that's called the cambium layer. It's a really big word called cambium. And basically what that is, is just the area of the plant that actually is living. It's the part where all of the nutrients and all of the, the life of the plant uh, is in that part of, of the stem. And what you do is you cut away the bark on both sides of these stems and you put them together. And you smash them together and you tape them and, and make sure that they're touching each other. And what that does is that allows the two uh, pieces of the plants to get to know each other and to grow together and eventually become one plant again together and they, and they fuse together. And when I think about grafting and I think about how this applies to um, my walk with Jesus or with God or, or um, my relationship with Jesus, I think of as you, as you grow as an adult, sometimes uh, you develop bark or you develop an outer shell uh, that's created from maybe certain experiences in life that might hurt you or, or things that were unpleasant. And so what Jesus likes to do is he likes to scrape away all that shell and all that bark to get down to your heart and that's how you really get to know Jesus and you let him into your heart and you let him grow together with you. And as you get older, eventually you become a big tall tree or a big plant as Jesus uh, attaches to your heart. And, and if you let him grow with you, um, you'll just be much better off in life. Um, so thanks for listening. And as you go back to your seats, I hope you guys have a great Sabbath. Please stand. Please stand as we sing. Opening hymn, Watch Ye Saints, led by Pro Musica.
today is for the Voice of Prophecy. We ask that you remember our guests that are here today, Pro Musica and the New England Youth Ensemble from WAU. Please mark your envelopes accordingly. And shall we bow our heads for prayer? Lord, we thank you so much for allowing us be, to be here today. And you thank, we thank you, Lord, for providing us so well financially. Lord, help us to remember, though, to give ourselves to you and to give our tithes and offerings accordingly. Please bless them, multiply them, so that they may influence people everywhere. We thank you so much for giving us this honor. And bless us in your name we pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath, Church. Today's scripture reading is going to be taken from the 11th chapter of Romans, verses 5 through 6. I will be reading through the New International Version. So too, 
at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if, and if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. Now is the time where we can come together and take a moment and pray. For those who are able, please kneel with me. God, I thank you for everyone in this room. I thank you for the musicians behind me that have given us the opportunity to be surrounded by music in a unique space of worship. Thank you, Lord, for the freedom to come on this Sabbath and rest and be with you. God, I also want to thank you for surrounding us with your grace. I pray that each and every person here today feels your grace and feels that love that you have given to us. God, I also want to recognize that there are people in our community and family members here that are hurting and that may be sick or have injuries that need to be healed. God, be with those people, be with their pain and comfort them. Help them know that you are there. Your grace is there. Your love is there. Your light is there for them. Lord, on this Sabbath, be with us and help us feel your presence. Thank you, Lord. Amen. have done this before, haven't I? <laughs> I was so anxious to talk to all of you beautiful people. Pro Musica, New England Youth Ensemble, wow, what a blessing you are to us. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here, right? Um, it's so great to see some familiar faces, uh, along with all of you when uh, we when you were singing on earth as it is in heaven, I was just nothing but chill bumps, and I thought, that's pretty accurate, that you have just ushered us in to the presence of God and given us a taste of heaven on earth, and we're just so appreciative for all of you being here. Uh, thank you, and I can't wait until your concert this afternoon at 5 o'clock. I hope all of you will join us here. Uh, but for now... An old letter I got years ago, dear Carl. I'm a former student of Walla Walla College and a former Seventh-day Adventist. I do, however, listen in to your sermon from time to time via the Internet. One thing that 
partially influenced my decision to leave the SDA church is the Adventist belief that they are somehow God's chosen remnant. Please, 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 he writes all caps, three exclamation points. He's not the first person to leave the church over our remnant theology. Just the notion of people thinking, well, we're better than. We're somehow God's chosen. It doesn't settle well with a lot of people. Now, his letter prompted a number of conversations over the years, very cordial and insightful dialogue. At one point, we actually looked up together the official definition of remnant. According to dictionary.com, remnant is defined as a scrap, a leftover piece of cloth. Now, that doesn't sound to me like something you should be boasting about, right? See, inherent in remnant theology is the good news that God loves even leftovers. There is space in God's remnant even for the scraps. Now, I bring this up because today we come across that verse in Romans where Paul talks about the remnant of God. We have been for months now working our way through the book of Romans. This is our final mini-series where we're looking at verses in the remaining chapters, wondering, okay, how does this play out in real life? Like, how do you and I now live the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ that Paul has been teaching us about? What does it look like in real life? And so now we come across this verse where Paul says in his salutation, he addresses the letter to all in Rome. And so our mini-series, we've crossed out the word Rome and inserted ourselves to all of those in Dayton. And listen what he says, chapter 1, verse 7. He says, to all in Rome, or Dayton, who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. Understand, this is remnant language here. Called by God to be his holy, that is, his set apart, his separated, special remnant people. Now, Paul is by no means the first to talk about remnant theology. You find this language from Genesis to Revelation, hundreds of references, dating all the way back to Genesis chapter 7, verse 23, where we find the story of the flood. And in that verse, we read, every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. So that phrase translated was left comes from the Hebrew word sha'ar, which means to remain. It's one of a half dozen or so root words for the word that we translate to be remnant. So what he's saying is Noah was a remnant along with his family. Now, Paul picks up this remnant language, chapter 11, verses 5 and 6, that Sonny read earlier, so too at the present time, there is a remnant, but notice, chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. You're not part of the remnant of God at the end of time based on your works. Paul goes on to explain, look, if it were grace, then it would no longer be grace if it was based on what you do. So you can do all kinds of spiritual feeling behaviors and works, 
Like, you can turn off the TV exactly at sundown on Friday night. You can eat all kinds of spiritual-sounding foods like tree bark and fry chick and little Debbies and so on. You can root for sports teams that sound spiritual, the saints and the angels and so on. It doesn't make you part of the remnant. No, we are a part of the remnant only by grace. Paul says, only by grace. Some years ago, I was at the SeaTac airport, and I found something on the floor there that was of great value. It was like the treasure buried in the field. I was so excited. It wasn't money. It was something more valuable than money, frequent flyer miles. But since the miles could be cashed in via this coupon, to an airline that I didn't fly, I opted for the other thing that it said on the coupon, or you have access to the Red Carpet Club. Now, up to this point, I didn't even know that airports have these business lounges. This was a whole new world to me, and I could bring a friend, so I invited my friend Pedro. We spent the entire day in the business lounge. Um, unlimited food, big screen TVs, sitting in very comfortable sofas, looking out at the jets, taxiing on the tarmac. It was wonderful. So Pedro and I were there all day. This was back before 9-11 where you could get through security without having an airline ticket like you were going to fly somewhere. We weren't there to go anywhere. We were there just to enjoy the red carpet cloud. We were club. We were part of the club. We were on the inside all day. Well, that afternoon, somebody got into the club who didn't look like he belonged there. He had long, scraggly beard, greasy hair, ripped jeans before it became fashionable to wear ripped jeans. He had this terribly offensive body odor. Pedro and I looked at each other and we asked at the same time, who let him in? Like, obviously, he doesn't belong here. It's like, how did he sneak by the receptionist at the door? How did he sneak in? Then, it dawned on us both at the same time when we were saying to each other, he doesn't belong in this club. It dawned on us, wait a minute. We don't belong here either. The only way we got into the club was I happened to find a voucher that gave us access. In other words, we were just there by grace as well. Nothing we did to deserve it. Well, this is the theology of the remnant in Scripture. Paul says, nothing you do, if it had to do with what you do, then it wouldn't be grace, Paul says. Now, would it? Of course not. For years, I served alongside another pastor on staff, very good friend, who told of how he really struggled with remnant theology, particularly back when we were in the seminary and, uh, and studying theology in college. Uh, he said it just smacked of elitism. He said it's just horrifying to think of saying to other Christ followers, look, I'm part of the remnant church, but you clearly are not because you don't worship on the same day that we do. You know, again, thinking somehow what we do gives us access to the remnant community. And so he really struggled with this. And he wasn't real discreet in sharing his feelings, particularly back when he was a student, until after class one day, a professor cornered him and said, Listen, Shane, if you have such an issue with our remnant theology, then I would suggest don't be an Adventist pastor. How can you pastor with any thread of integrity at all if you don't even believe 
this doctrine in Scripture, which led him then to take a two-week sabbatical of fasting and praying. The entire two weeks, he just studied this one topic of what does it mean to be a part of the remnant at the end of time. Listen to how he tells his story. He says, during that two weeks, I discovered Christ and his grace. I learned that salvation was indeed free, that in fact, I was at my heart a judgmental legalist, but that Jesus loved me whether I followed him or not. I was liberated, set free. I was for the very first time truly a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, a true member of the remnant and a believer in its mission. Then he asks, and what is that remnant and its mission? Now, this is a key question. After all, the final chapters in Romans get very practical, and they call us now to live on mission. Thus, the title of this mini-series, To All Who Are in Dayton, we want to know, what does that even mean now? To live the gospel. What is that mission? Shane goes on, my two weeks of study helped me understand the mission of God's remnant people is to share the gospel with the world. The remnant described in Scripture is a magnetic movement. And then he says, parenthetically, note the emphasis here on action. Okay, The remnant is this magnetic motion, this movement by and for Christ, one that is called to attract others to him. So we are not the remnant church, which surely smacks of arrogance and elitism. We are instead the church called to gather, to include, to invite the remnant. In other words, We who are Adventists are not all there is. There are millions more to come. The focus is on service, not exclusivity. And thus, an arrogant Adventist is no Adventist at all. Yes, we are called to be a part of God's remnant community. But what that means is we are called to invite others. It's not about exclusivity at all, just the opposite. It is about service, which is why we began this worship experience together with foot Washing, symbolic of what Christ has called us as his remnant people to be about. It's about serving others. And I know many denominations do not practice this ordinance of humility or foot washing, and we do, and the reason we do is because, look, we're just trying to live and to love like Jesus. And so when we see Jesus washing the feet of others, serving them, then that's just what we want to do. And now we gather around the Lord's table, and we are reminded through the broken bread of his broken body. We are reminded through the grape juice of his spilled blood. We are reminded in this whole communion service. It's not about works. Yes, there is a remnant people, Paul says. Even today in Rome, or even today in Dayton, there is a remnant people that are marked by grace and inclusivity, service. And so at this time, I would invite my fellow pastors and the deacons to come forward as we are now going to serve you the bread and the grape juice. And I invite you just to hang on to those emblems for a moment, and then we will participate together.
Amen. Matthew 26, starting in verse 26, says, As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, from this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. This is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. Let us pray. God, it's in these symbols of your body and your blood that we take hope knowing that you offer forgiveness and you offer grace. And in that, we have healing. Bless them as we partake this morning. Amen. And after Jesus had given thanks, he broke the bread, distributed it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, for this is my body, which is broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood, which is spilled for you for the forgiveness of many. Drink of it, all of you. As Jason also read in the text, it tells us that they sang a hymn as they left. And so I invite you to stand together as we sing our closing hymn.
with us now and empower us by your spirit to live in love like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. It is our custom every communion Sabbath four times a year we take up a special offering that we use specifically for uh, members in crisis. And I wish everybody could just live one day in the life of a pastor because we get many requests. And it's only because of your generosity on communion Sabbath that we can respond and we can help to very tangible, real needs. So thank you for your generous offerings as you leave. Also a reminder, the prayer room right through this door will be open following the postlude.